Om Agana Timurandasya, Ganon Jana Shalakaya, Chakshurun Militang Yena, Tasmai Sri Guruvenama, Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gradhar, Sri Vasadi Gor Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Tonight we're going to warm you up a bit for Lord Nishringa's appearance day coming in two days Wednesday We're going to discuss The prelude. What Hiranyakashipu, Pallad Maharaj's evil father, was doing, how the higher beings, the devas, the demigods reacted, how the Supreme Personality of God had responded. We're going to focus on a question asked by Yudhisthira Maharaj, dialoguing with Narada Muni, submissively inquiring. And that same question will reoccur because it's so astonishing. However, before we go any further, a few logistical details. For those of you interested, Wednesday's class will start an hour earlier. That's 6 p.m. And that will be it for this week. There'll be, as far as I know, nothing on Friday. And we'll announce the schedule, what may be, for the coming weeks. So let's start talking about Lord Nishingadev. And when you speak about Lord Nishingadev, how can you not speak about Prahlad Maharaj? So the question asked, at the end of the first chapter of the seventh canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Sri Yudhisthira Vacha Vidve Shodayate Putre Katamasin Mahatmani Bruhi Me Bhagavan Yena Paladas Yachu Tatmata Maharaj Yudhisthira inquired, Oh, my Lord, Narada Muni, why was there such enmity between Haranyakashipu and his beloved son, Prahlad Maharaj? How did Prahlad Maharaj become such a great devotee of Lord Krishna? Kindly explain this to me. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is referred to as Achuta, infallible. And let's take the inner meaning of that. Infallible in terms of loving exchanges with his devotees. Everyone would like to be connected to an infallible lover, an infallible friend. an infallible child, an infallible master. That is Krishna Achutta. He never fails in exchanges of rasa with his devotees. 
And as Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport, devotees are called achutatma. Those who are attached to the infallible. Those whose life and soul is achuta. I know several wonderful devotees with the name Achutatma, one in St. Petersburg, Russia, another in Cardiff, Wales. So the whole point of Yudhisthira Maharaj's inquiry is that he wants to receive an explanation from Narada Muni, how Prahlad developed such a concentration on a chuta. So where do we go from here? Let's start thinking about the unparalleled power, when measured materially, that is, of course, possessed by Hiranyakashipu. Palad Maharaj's demoniac father. He actually, Ranyakashipu, remember, was able to control not one city, not one tract of land under whatever name, not one planet. He was actually able to control almost all the universe. He couldn't control Lord Brahma and Lord Brahma's abode. That's why he performed severe austerities in order to get a benediction from Brahma that would de facto, indirectly, he thought, make him more powerful or as powerful as Brahma. He thought that he had tricked Brahma into granting him immortality, something that no demigod can do. You hear the rain falling in the background. This area of New Zealand definitely needs some rain, so we're thankful for it. And it's nice that the rain is coming at night. Before I forget, I've just been reminded that class Wednesday starts at 5 p.m. Oh, not 6 p.m., but 5 p.m. New Zealand time. Thank you, Gore R.T. Davy Dasi, for sending that reminder. Now back to Hiranyakashipu and his atrocities. So he controlled almost the whole universe. Everyone bowed down to him except Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. Even great sages like Narada Muni and his associates went along with the game externally. Hiranyakashipu occupied the throne, the palace of Indra and enjoyed all the heavenly arrangements, luxuries. Haranyakashipu took over the control of all aspects of nature. In other words, he made the demigods redundant. <laughs> he told them, take a hike. And he took over all their capacities. This is how powerful he was. You know how he got that power through extreme austerity, tapa. He was the master of that tapa, austerity, yoga, mystic yoga, bala strength, and ojas, sensual strength. Mm. 
these kind of personalities appear from time to time with varying degrees of such powers that human beings wonder, where did that power come from? And even such leaders can cause such havoc, such catastrophes, genocide and wars, world wars. And then afterwards, people scratch their heads. Why did so many listen to this leader? It's empowerment by Maya, the illusory energy. The illusory energy raises up such unqualified leaders to give the suitable reactions to unqualified persons who want to follow unqualified leaders. Generally speaking, it's like that. Hiranyakashipu was a special case. So we spoke about his extraordinary powers. Everyone, even the demigods, the higher beings trembled in fear. If ever there was a person who had it all materially, it was Hiranyakashipu. <clears throat> Opulence, riches, bodily strength, sensual power. He was just drowning in it. What the average person today would consider, oh, the utmost. Hiranyakashipu had that all. But here's a point. Amidst the description of all Hiranyakashipu's materially unparalleled wealth and power of control and sensual indulgence, indeed he terrorize the whole universe. You talk about someone terrorizing one small country, even all of Europe or part of Europe or all of the USA. But Hiranyakashipu is able to terrorize practically the whole universe. It's all relative, you see. You might say, oh, but isn't that mythological? Someone with that much power? But you're accustomed to terrorism on a small scale. How Nikashipu operates on with the same demoniac principles on a much greater scale. It's like We make a big thing, and rightfully so, about terrorist dictators who control nations. But when you talk about some street gang leader, it's not considered very significant. Well, compared to Hiranyakashipu, the tyrants that we know about in recent history were like, in comparison, they were like street gang leaders controlling a couple of blocks of a city. Nevertheless, whether you're a small time despot or a cosmic despot, when it comes to trying to enjoy your senses and achieve satisfaction is the same underlying principle. So please note this about Hiranyakashipu. Striking example of this underlying principle. No satisfaction, no satiation, no lasting fulfillment in spite of possessing such immense 
indulgence, resources. So let's hear. Srimad Bhagavatam, 7th canto, chapter 4, text 19. Sa itam nijita kakub, ekarad vishayan priyan, yato pajosham bunjano, natripya ajitendriyaha. In spite of achieving the power to control in all directions, and in spite of enjoying all types of dear sense gratification as much as possible, Harandikashipu was dissatisfied because instead of controlling his senses, he remained their servant. Let's let that sink in for a while. Mm. He had it all, more than you could ever dream of, what to speak of having. And still he's dissatisfied. The principle here is that, well, we'll read a bit of Prabhupada's purport. This is an example of asuric life, demonic life. Atheists can advance materially and create an extremely comfortable situation for the senses. Give them credit for that. But because they are controlled by the senses, they cannot be satisfied. This is the effect of modern civilization. Hmm. Without sense control, there's no question of inner peace or external peace. There'll be dissatisfaction within and anxiety and anger and frustration without. I don't know if you've consciously been around a person who has many desires or even just a few desires, but they don't seem to be able to satisfy those desires. They can be very angry. They can be very mm, nasty and just unpleasant to be around. This is what uncontrolled senses can do to us. Whereas someone who practically has nothing in terms of material resources, material wealth or material comfort, but who can control the senses instead of being their servant, such a person can actually be peaceful. And in order to be happy, you have to first be peaceful. So Shila Prabhupada points out to us, Hiranyakashipu was a vivid example of this dissatisfied state of humanity. Mm. So let's not just treat Hiranyakashipu like he was some kind of bizarre ogre, whereas we are normal people. No. Being victimized by materialistic societies, we take as the norm that we become the servant of our senses and therefore we'll never know satisfaction. Seems contradictory, I know. If I get it, finally what I want, there'll be relief, there'll be fulfillment. It's never like that. In other words, we're dealing with an energy that cheats us, the illusory energy. It has different looks, it flashes at us. Different mirages, different hallucinations. And because so many people are, have bought into it and will buy into it, the situation looks so 
status quo. Yeah, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. Therefore, we need to remember Hranyakashipu. The Hranyakashipu principle, I call it. I've got it all and more, and I'm still dissatisfied because I'm the servant of my senses. I'm not in control of my senses. So we're on the way to understanding why Hranyakashipu treated Prahlad in such a way. Prahlad had it all, the opposite of Hranyakashipu. Divine qualities. His father was envious of him. We'll be talking more about Prahlad in terms of bhava. Because near the end of this chapter, fourth canto, seventh canto, you'll hear the characteristics of Prahlad's ecstatic love even as a child, despite having such a hard father. <clears throat> because of Hiranyakashipu's effect on the universe, the demigods finally couldn't take it anymore. And in such acute distress, they approached the Supreme Personality of Godhead. How do they do that? You might want to know. They offered their respectful obeisances unto that direction where the Supreme Personality of Godhead is situated. Well, you might say, well, where's that direction? Isn't the Supreme Personality of Godhead everywhere? in every atom, in every heart, in every direction, by offering their respectful obeisances unto that direction where the Supreme Personality God is situated, that means the places where he enacts his pastimes, his leelas. And they got an answer. In sound. They didn't see in the normal way, but they saw through their ears. They heard a transcendental sound vibration emanating from someone not visible to material eyes. And that sound drove away all their fear. This is the voice of the Supreme Personality of God. Encouraging the demigods to make progress in bhakti yoga by hearing and chanting. By offering me prayers, he said. And then he reassured them, I know all about what Hiranyakashipu is doing. I will surely stop his activities very soon. Please be patient. Wait patiently. Now embedded in this hearing by the demigods of just sound are some deep principles. Tatpa. The science of the supreme. They didn't see as we thought they see or someone can see, but you see the nine processes of bhakti, Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, hearing and chanting, worshiping, and so forth. They're all absolute, meaning they all are direct darshan, they all provide direct vision of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That's the 
advanced stage of bhakti, the re, when we recover from our material afflictions. That ability to see Krishna depends on our bhakti. So, in the ultimate sense, there's no difference between worshiping the deity in the temple, seeing the deity and chanting the glories. These are all ways of seeing the Supreme Personality Godhead. Why? Because everything in bhakti yoga is a means of direct contact with Krishna. Taking prasad, if we take prasad in the proper bhakti consciousness, we're seeing the Supreme Personality of God. Swap prasad on the Lobha, Radha Krishna Gunagao, Premedako Chaitanya Nitai. Taking prasad for glorifying their lordships, Shishi Radha and Krishna, and calling out for the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda. So, although the voice was coming from a person apparently unseen, there is vision, there is darshan through the sound. The Supreme Personality of God it is present through sound vibration. This is different than the laws of the material world. This is different from what any mundane scientist can verify or experience. There's no difference between seeing Krishna, offering Krishna prayers, and hearing Krishna's glories. This is why we're fully satisfied by Kirtan. Hearing, chanting, we're actually seeing through the ears. Gradually, we'll realize that more and more. So this voice, which all the higher beings knew, was the voice of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, told them, I understand the situation. Be patient, I am coming. There'll be some apparent suffering until you see me emerge from the pillar. Be patient. So what was the demigod's reaction. They heard about how when Hiranyakashipu teases his great devotee son, Prahlad, teases is a mild word, actually, when he tries to torture him. The voice told them, I'll kill him immediately. Despite the benedictions of Brahma. Hmm. Remember all severe austerities like never done before that Harunikashipu performed in order to steal immortality in a stealthy way. But the Supreme Personality God, it assures the devas, despite the benedictions of Brahma, I'll kill him immediately at the right moment. Be patient, be tolerant of some inconvenience up until then. In other words, 
Supreme Personality God and is telling them, I can tolerate so much, but not violence to my devotee. So we asked, what was the response of the Davis? Residents of the heavenly planets. They offered their respectful obeisances and went back to their respective residences, confident that basically Hiranyakashipu is dead. <laughs> they had no doubts. Just by hearing, seeing through their ears, they knew what the outcome was going to be of this greatest terroristic leader in history. Of course, this event is far earlier than what contemporary historians consider history to be. So let's talk about the unique characteristics of Prahlad Maharaj. He had all the good qualities we normally talk about. The best friend of everyone, respectful, to the poor he was like a father, to his equals he was attached like a sympathetic brother. He considered his superiors, his spiritual superiors, to be as good as the Supreme Personality got it. Completely free from unnatural pride that might have arisen from his aristocratic, wealthy position. He had all that. But we've been discussing Bhava. And Prahlad just emanated the symptoms of ecstatic love. One thing to bear in mind is that Prahlad Maharaj, of course, is eternal. He resides in Vaikuntha Loka as well as within this material world on the planet Sutala. You see, just as Krishna can be present in Goloka as well as in the core of everyone's heart, similarly, his devotees share, his pure devotees share that quality to a partial degree. In other words, a devotee can be qualified like the Supreme Personality got it. Not in full though, but partially. So Prahlad Maharaj had the transcendental quality of existing simultaneously in different places. Narada Muni assures King Yudhisthira that in any assembly where there are talks about saintly devotees, even the higher beings, the demigods, will always cite Prahlad Maharaj. It would go something like this. This devotee is like Prahlad. In other words, Prahlad is the gold standard. A term back when the world's currencies were tied to the value of gold. So Prahlad was the gold standard for Bhakti. When you wanted to talk about someone's stellar 
exceptional bhakti, you'd say, oh, like Prahlad. Prahlad showed these qualities from childhood. He wasn't interested in playing around as a kid. He just remained silent, fully absorbed in the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And <clears throat> devotees of that stature literally actually can't understand how does the world go on fully absorbed in mundane affairs? How can anyone do that? Because Prahlad Maharaj's mind was always saturated with bhakti. Everything else, mundane affairs and why people would be attached to him, was just incomprehensible to him. Why would anyone want to do that? One interesting term in one of the verses is Krishna Graha, the influence, the Krishna influence. Those of you who know a little something of Vedic astrology know that sometimes it's said someone is under the influence of this planet or that planet, Saturn or so on and so forth. And that, materially speaking, blocks any material progress, that mm, negative planetary influence, that negative Raha. But Prahlad Maharaj had the opposite. He was under the influence of the Krishna Graha. He was totally transcendental. He couldn't think of the material world and he couldn't live without bhakti. So again, like just like someone's under the influence of a planet that has negative effects for material prosperity and development. Prahlad was under the influence of the Krishna planet and its planetary effects. It's up to us what we want to make our life in terms of the influence that we want to operate under. When you think about Prahlad Maharaj, his mind was not attracted to Krishna in some kind of forced way, in a way by the power of regulations. He wasn't in the therapeutic stage of bhakti. His mind was completely overcome by Krishna. He was greedy for Krishna. He didn't, again, he didn't understand the world of material affairs. Not that he was some kind of fool, no, but how could anyone be so absorbed in this? That was the point. He understood the world of Krishna. This is the eternal constitutional position and activity for all living entities. One interesting point was that his awareness of his worshipable Lord was like a child, a babe on the lap of its mother. Think about it. You see, Prahlad Maharaj is described as always being embraced by the Lord. So much so that he doesn't know how his bodily necessities are going on. Bodily activities like sitting, walking, eating, lying down, drinking and talking. 
these are all carried on automatically. So what does that mean? That he doesn't know how his bodily necessities, his bodily affairs are functioning. That example of a small child on the lap of its mother. The infant doesn't really know how its needs for food and sleep and urinating and evacuating are all going on. The infant doesn't know that, but still those bodily affairs are happening and the mother is taking care of all that. The infant is simply satisfied to be on the lap of the mother. The mother is taking care of all the bodily affairs. An infant has no understanding. Just the food comes, the urinating, the evacuation is going on, the sleeping, the reclining, just all happening to the infant. The infant is just focused on the affection of the mother. And similarly, Prahlad Maharaj is just focused on his relationship with his worshipful Lord. Beautiful example given by the Acharyas, Srila Prabhupada and Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur. Just like a child, an infant is always embraced by the mother. Similarly, Prahlad Maharaj is always embraced by his worshipful Lord. And you get a glimpse into the fascinating world of love in separation in Prahlad Maharaj. Of course, you'll see that much more with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But Prahlad Maharaj gives you some insight. Kwachid rudati vaikunta chinta shabala chaitana kwachid dasati touch chinta lada udga yati kwachid. Because of advancement in Krishna consciousness, he sometimes cried, sometimes laughed, sometimes expressed jubilation, and sometimes sang loudly. You can extend the infant's example more. An infant's on its mother's lap, and then the mother has to go away and do something. So she puts the infant down, and so the infant starts crying. But as soon as the mother returns, the child laughs, becomes joyful. So similarly, Prahlad Maharaj, always absorbed in thinking about Krishna, sometimes was affected by separation. Where is Krishna? This is most deeply explained by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Shunyaya tam jagat sarvam govinda virahename. The whole universe seems empty. It is empty without Govinda. Wait a minute, how can you say empty? There's so much activity going on. No, empty, zero, shunya, nothing. So therefore such a devotee, feeling that Krishna is invisible for him or her, feeling that Krishna has gone away, such a devotee cries in separation. This is Anjalila, Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. But then, when such a devotee sees that Krishna has returned, returned to care for him, in the case of Prahlad Maharaj, such a devotee jumps up if, and laughs.
just like a child laughs upon understanding that mother has returned to care for it. So this is all about bhava. These symptoms that you're hearing about in Pallad Maharaj are all symptoms of bhava. And Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur gives us further elucidation. When Prahlad wouldn't see his worshipable Lord, he would think, where's my Lord gone? He's given me up. And his mind would become transcendentally troubled, not materially troubled, but transcendentally. And he would cry. And then the Lord would return. Oh, Prahlad, oh child, why are you crying? Just because you haven't seen me for a moment. And then Prahlad would laugh like a happy child that sees its mother again. And the mother embraces him. Happily, Prahlad thinks, my Lord has made me happy by showing himself to me again by his mercy. More symptoms of Pallad's ecstasy. Narati kwachit utkanto vladjo nrityati kwachit kwachit tad bhavana yuktas tanmayo nu chakaraha Sometimes upon seeing the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Pallad Maharaj would loudly call in full anxiety. He sometimes lost his shyness in jubilation and began dancing in ecstasy. And sometimes being fully absorbed in thoughts of Krishna, he felt oneness and imitated the pastimes of the Lord. This feeling oneness doesn't mean impersonalism, merging. It means Imitating the Lord's pastimes. The example given by Srila Prabhupada is that sometimes the cowherd boys in the forest of Braj would imitate the behavior of jungle animals. So similarly, Sometimes the devotee, absorbed in complete ecstasy, imitates the pastimes of the Lord. The gopis did this in the middle of the night in the forest of Vrindavan, searching for Krishna. More about Prahlad's ecstatic relationship is activities in pure love. When the Lord had disappeared from Pallad's vision and then Pallad would suddenly see him appear at a great distance. The Lord himself would cry out, Oh Pallad, dear child, without seeing you I get no satisfaction since you alone are most dear to me. That's when Prahlad would start dancing without shame or shyness. Then, when the Lord disappeared and the great pain of separation, transcendental pain, mind you, the great pain of separation would envelop Prahlad he would lose himself in deep thoughts of the Lord and identify himself as the Lord. This is a kind of madness in love. It's not impersonalism. He would, Prahlad would imitate the pastimes of Rama and Krishna, 
when they appeared in the squirrel. So these are some of the ecstasy, ecstatic symptoms demonstrated by Prahlad. His spiritual jubilation, hair standing on end, tears gliding down from half-closed eyes because of his love. Sometimes in separation and the grief it brought about, Prahlad would close his eyes and then suddenly he would see his worshipful Lord in his heart. And he would feel the touch of the Lord's hand and Prahlad would be lost in ecstasy, his hair standing on end. Stunned, he wouldn't move, be able to move his half-closed eyes filled with tears. Overwhelmed with affection for his worshipful Lord. The effect Prahlad had on his associates was that he turned the minds of all his friends to bhakti. He influenced these friends. He cleansed their minds by his association. All while never being disturbed by the chastisements of his demoniac father. So your question could be, the Acharyas point out, how could Prahlad have such steady bhakti amidst such bad association as his his demoniac father and others. His boyhood friends were also from demoniac families. Why he had no danger from this bad association. Palab was so powerful that he brought the minds of others to the lotus feet of the Lord. So now we get to the echo of that question raised at the end of the first chapter. How did this enmity happen? How did Prahlad have a father who terrorized such a son with these divine qualities? What's going on here? It's a very important question. That's why it's asked twice in variegated ways at the end of the first chapter of the seventh canon and now at the end of the fourth chapter. So <clears throat> Narada Muni is going to provoke that question again from Yudhisthira. He says, my dear King Yudhisthira, the demon Hiranyakashipu tormented this exalted fortunate devotee, although Prahlad was his own son. You just dear, again, as we said, says, okay, uh, I need to know more. Sri Yudhisthira Vacha Devarsha Etar Itschamo Vedatum Tava Suvrata Yaratma Jaya Shraddhaya Pitada Sadavehakam. Maharaj Yudhisthira said, O best of the saints among the demigods, O best of spiritual leaders, how did Hiranyagashipu give so much trouble to Prahlad Maharaj? the pure and exalted saint. Although Prahlad was his own son, I wish to know about this subject from you. You just here knew I'm inquiring from the right person. I'm inquiring from a proper spiritual authority. I'm not, I'm, I'm not asking these questions simply to just anyone. <clears throat> it's very important in bhakti. 
So again, as we said, Yudhisthira is asking in great astonishment, how could a father treat his own son, especially such a qualified son, in such a horrible, torturous way? So Yudhisthira elaborates about how a father and mother are always affectionate toward their own children. All right, sometimes children are disobedient, but the father and mother chastise the children, not from hatred or envy, but out of love for the child's well-being, welfare, upbringing, proper upbringing. So then why, how did Hiranyakashipu, Pallad Maharaj's father, chastise such an extraordinarily beautiful, qualified son? Yudhisthira says, this is what I'm eager to know. That eagerness to hear is such an important quality in bhakti. When our eagerness to hear Srimad Bhagavatam diminishes, then we know we've got a problem. And when that eagerness increases, then we should know we're getting purified. I've got to hear. I've got to be there with, where that hearing is going on. But Maharaj Yudhisthira is not finished. He's really <laughs> teaching us that this is an extraordinary situation. He's coming at it from different angles, all focused on the same point. How could this happen? He's really, by his questions, setting the scene for quite a few chapters that are going to come about Hiranyakashipu, Prahlad Maharaj, Lord Nishingadev. Maharaj Yudhisthira further inquired, how is it possible for a father to be so violent toward an exalted son who was obedient, well-behaved and respectful to his father? O Brahmana, O Master, I have never heard of such a contradiction as an affectionate father is punishing his noble son with the intention of killing him. Kindly dissipate our doubts in this regard. I'm eager, please dissipate our doubts. <laughs> so this is our preamble, our lead up to Wednesday's class, which will be 5 p.m. New Zealand time, two hours earlier than normal. Let's see if we have time for one or two questions. Kasturika Devi Dasi from India is asking about distress in bhakti. She says that I mentioned in previous class how distress does not automatically open people to bhakti, even though this world is full of distress. And that it's contact with the devotee which makes the crucial difference. Not just distress in of itself. So she raises the point of Kunti Devi in the first canto. She says, Tamma Kinchana Gotram. Krishna, you're attained by those who are materially exhausted, not by those who are attached to material opulence. They can't call out your name with feeling. 
So Kasturika Devi Dasi is asking that Kunti Devi is praying for more distress to come. Actually, no. She's not attached to happiness or distress. She's attached to Krishna. And she's noted that whenever the Pandavas are in distressful circumstances, Krishna comes. So she's thinking, if that's the case, then let the distressful circumstances come because we're attached to Krishna, not happiness or distress. But we've just noticed the facts here. <laughs> It's a subtle but important difference. She's not a masochist. Oh, just give me distress. Mm. In Brihad Bhagavatamrita, it's described that the Pandavas plot, they concoct so called distressful situations so that Krishna will come. <laughs> They're thinking, how do we how do we get his association very quickly? Doing another huge yagya like a Rajasuya yagya, oh, that'll take too long. We've got to come up with something else. So this is love beyond what is known in the material world. So when Kunti Devi makes her famous declaration, let these calamities come again and again. She's saying that out of pure love because she says the real calamity is that Krishna is leaving Hastinapur and he's about to return to Dwarka. That's the real calamity. He's leaving us. The distress is not the real calamity. The real calamity is Krishna's departure. All right. So Kasturika Devi Dasi asks, what about for spiritual aspirants, how should we see distress? Guess what? Material existence is nothing but distress. But because we have desires that are artificial for satisfaction, fulfillment, and well being in such a distressful place. We don't see the distress all the time. Some of the time we do, and then we cry out in agony. But actually the whole package is distress. Except for those who are fully situated on the spiritual platform, and that's the only solution. So in knowing that, Distress can become a positive impetus for devotees to take more shelter of Krishna. A devotee is the perfect opportunist. He or she knows how to use anything and everything for being propelled more closely to Krishna's lotus feet. And we have to beg for that ability, that transcendental talent whatever comes our way krishna bring me closer and we have a question three questions from esther in cardiff wales let's see how many we can do tonight she first asks how can one really harmonize with Krishna when we are inferior to him and we are propelled by the modes of material nature? The transcendental fact of existence is that we are qualitatively equal to Krishna. In other words, we've really buried ourselves deep into illusion. As long as we don't understand that we are qualitatively equal with Krishna. We won't understand what our activities in perfection are. 
We won't even be able to properly come out of the bodily conception of life. How can we harmonize with Krishna? That's what the process of purification is all about. The more we embrace that process of purification, the more we become qualified to, to retain, or regain our original harmony with Krishna. That harmony is in pure love. Therefore, the example is given about the green bird flying into the green tree. The green bird is not the green tree, but because it shares the same color as the green tree, the two look indistinguishable. In that sense, they are one. But still, the green bird is the bird and the tree is the tree. This is an example of pure love. Next, she asks, are there any signs or symptoms for the devotee that we are beginning to reach a potential harmonization with Krishna? Yes, when we follow Krishna's instructions, and we're singing, Yasya Prasada, Bhagavad Prasada, Yasya Prasada, Nagatikato. When the spiritual master is pleased, we make spiritual advancement. Otherwise, there's havoc. So we're making progress to the extent that we follow the instructions. Her last question is, how can we see that spiritual life is the highest welfare service? When, oh, I see, she has a job as a social worker. So, so much of her day is spent uh, tending to material welfare work. So she's asking, how can we not get deflated by this absorption in material welfare work because that's her occupation and no doubt sometimes it can really be really take wear and tear on you whatever kind of job we have we have to keep ourselves fresh by appropriate hearing and chanting about Krishna, associating with devotees. Those who live in the ashram have to do that. Those who are in the working world have to do that. We have to know how to refresh and nourish ourselves. Then we'll always be able to keep the right vision, the right perspective. Otherwise, we could become overwhelmed. I was just reading about one tragedy that happened in New York City during the pandemic. One very talented young doctor, she was like in her early 30s, <clears throat> and she was head of the emergency room services which means she had expertise and the right mentality to head up the emergency services of a hospital in New York City. All her associates at work said she was so talented and so competent, but she was becoming overwhelmed by seeing day after day the, the pandemic results ambulance after ambulance of 
dying person's coming. So just a few days ago, she just finished her life. So yes, during doing such essential welfare activities can be very draining. One becomes depressed. Everything look, can look help, hopeless. We need to keep sight on what is the real cure while administering, if it's our job, the temporary fixes. For our devotees, our bhakti practitioners, they must keep themselves nourished and surcharged through the processes of devotional service and association with devotees. Especially if we sideline our need to associate with devotees, we then, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasi Thakur says, we then lose our ability to distinguish between material and spiritual affairs. It all becomes a blur. Last question by Esther's husband, Boma Vrindavan Das from Cardiff, Wales. He writes, in the fifth canto, Krishna is described as dira or equipoised. Always in the transcendental position, never agitated. Yet we see circumstances in which Krishna displays a perceived agitation when his devotees are insulted or put in danger. Well, if this is not agitation, then what is Krishna displaying? So Boma Vrindavan thought this is an appropriate question because Lord Nishinga's appearance day is soon upon us. And he ends by saying, Nishinga Dave seemed uh, a bit agitated. <laughs> upon his ripping apart Haranyakashipu. Tune in to Wednesday, 5 p.m. New Zealand time, and you'll hear about Lord Nishingadev's infinite agitation, infinite anger, without one trace of material influence. So in that way, he's still Dira. He's completely equipoised because his anger has no material tinge to it. If the Supreme Personality of God it is unlimited, then he's unlimited in everything. If he can marry 16,108 wives in Dwarka, he can have such anger as Lord Nishingadev, everything unlimited. Yet, in his Nara Leela, in his human like pastimes, that is where the sweetness is. All right. I thank you very much. Hare Krishna.